Great, so um, welcome back everyone uh, for our first talk uh, this morning or this afternoon, whatever the time, the time may be where you happen to be. Um, we're very lucky to have Kristen Hendricks. Uh, the title of her talk is Homology Corporatism and Evaluative Hager for Homology. Okay, uh, so thanks so much for having me. It's a delight to be here. I was at this conference last year. I, I thought it was a real standout among the online formats that had been tried and I'm thrilled to be back. Okay, so today I wanna to tell you a little bit about the homology cobordism group and an application to its structure coming from involutive Haygard floor homology. And before I say anything else, all of the new work in this talk is joint work with Jen Hom, Matt Stoffregan, and Ian Zepke. Okay, so this talk sort of has two parts. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history of the homology cobordism group and what we know about it, cultivating in a main theorem. And then subsequent to that, I'm going to talk to you about where, the, where that theorem is coming from and what constructions sort of play into it. All right, so with that in mind, let's get started on part one. So, all right, what are our protagonists today? We're going to think about integer homology spheres. So these are going to be closed-oriented three-manifolds with the same integer homology as the three-dimensional sphere. Um, so these are things that can't be told apart by homology from just being S3. And we're gonna think about these up to an equivalence relationship, a relation called homology cobordism. Um, and we're gonna say two integer homology spheres are homology cobordin. If there's a smooth, compact, oriented four manifold between them, whose boundary is the disjoint union of minus y1 and y2, so it's cobordism from one to the other, such that inclusion on either end is gonna induce an isomorphism on homology. So you're supposed to think the important thing here is that W looks like a product from the point of view of homology, can't be told apart from y cross i up to homology. Um, as the talk goes on, we'll sort of see why you might care about this equivalence relation, but maybe it's just sort of a preliminary thought about why this might be an appropriate choice. So um, if we want to think about three manifolds up to cobordism, um, if I look at close three manifolds up to any old cobordism I could put in there, they will all be equivalent uh, by the licorice wellis construction. Um, and if maybe then after I've discarded that as a bad idea, the next thing I would try is homotopy cobordism, which is the same, or H cobordism, which is the same idea with uh, the homology replaced by homotopy. The problem with that is almost nothing is equivalent because three manifolds are very close to being determined by their fundamental group. And also that it's an extremely difficult concept to work with. So homology cobordism is gonna be on this nice level of flexibility where we have some interesting relationships it's easy enough for us to get a handle on it today, maybe. And furthermore, that we're gonna see that it has some interesting, some interesting relationships to other concepts in topology. Okay, so with all that said, all right, and then maybe I should give you some examples of the manifolds that are homology spheres. So here's a couple, let's name some examples. So one way to get examples is if I've got a knot in S3, well, I, I know how to do surgery on knots. Um, so I've, I've got two knots there. I've got a green unknot and a green trefoil. How do I do a surgery? I cut out a solid torus along those. I've got two curves on the surface of that torus. I've got a meridional curve linked around the unknot. And I've got a longitudinal curve, which will intersect the meridian once and have linking number zero with the green knot. Um, in general, to get a P over Q surgery, I cut out a solid torus along K and I re-glue so that the meridian goes tomologically to P copies of meridian and Q copies of the longitude. Um, it's not hard to satisfy yourself using my review torus with the first homology of that is Z mod PZ. So this means that if, if I do plus or minus one over Q surgery, I'll get an integer homology sphere. Another example that's important to us is if I've got PQ and R coprime, then I can look at the manifold sigma PQR, which is the intersection of the zero set of Z1 to the P plus Z2 to the Q plus Z3 to the R in C3, and a small sphere of radius epsilon around the origin. So sanity check in real dimensions, C3 is six dimensional. The zero set of that polynomial is four dimensional and the sphere is five dimensional, nine minus six is three. Everyone is happy. And you can check that that's actually a homology sphere of PQ and R coprime. This is called a Brice corn sphere. Okay, um, some examples of the examples, sigma two, three, five, which is also a plus one surgery on the trefoil I drew on the preceding page with the orientation reverse is a famous first example called the Poincaré homology sphere. So it's the only example of finite fundamental group. The fundamental group is the binary acosahedral group, um, apart from the three sphere that is. And uh, sigma two, three, seven is 
uh, which is also minus one surgery on the trefoil or plus one surgery on the figure eight knot, which is drawn there for people who don't think about knots all the time, is also an example that we might like to be able to name later. And maybe some examples of things that are homology coordinate to each other. So a couple of null homology coordinates. If you're a slice knot, which is to say you bound a smooth disc in B4, there's an example right there. Then plus or minus one over Q surgery on you is null homology coordinate. Another famous example is that the breeze point sphere sigma 257 is null homology coordinate. Okay, um, I used the word group a little while ago. What do I mean by that? Um, so the integer homology cobordism group is going to be all of our oriented integer homology spheres with a operation given by connect sum up to the equivalence relation of homology cobordism. So what are the features of this group? The identity is S3. You're trivial if you bound a smooth integer homology four ball. Um, and and, and uh, inverses go just by, take, by orientation reversal. And a, co a couple of remarks about this definition. One remark is that smoothness matters. So it's a theorem of Friedman that every integer homology sphere bounds an acyclic topological four ball. So if I was allowing topological W4s, this whole construction would be trivial. And the fact that it's not going to turn out to be is really reflective of the fact that the smooth and topological categories in dimension four are very different. Um, and also dimension matters. So the analogous thing in uh, dimensions one and two is trivial. It's easy to satisfy yourself of that. Um, and the correct, the most natural analog in higher dimensions, which is actually the piecewise linear homology cobordism group rather than the smooth homology cobordism group is also trivial for n greater than equal to four. Okay, um, what is known about this group? Well, um, I've defined this group in a sort of complicated way, right? It's a group of manifolds, but it's nevertheless a group. And you can ask all the questions you learned to ask about groups in your algebra class back in undergrad. You can ask what subgroups does it have? What summons does it have? Does it have torsion, et cetera? All that kind of questions. Um, so what's known about this group? Well, until the 80s, much of what was known about this group was the existence of the milner rockland homomorphism. So it's got a subjection on the Z mod 2Z. An example of a thing in the pre-image of the non-trivial element is the Poincaré homology sphere. So how does that work? I can always pick a spin four manifold whose boundary is y. I look at what I look at the signature of that. I divide by eight. That modulo two is a homology cobordism invariant. Um, and I was not alive for this part of the story, but I'm informed that it was popular to conjecture that this was going to turn out to be an isomorphism. However, it's not. So um, once we got gauge theory in the early 80s, a lot of problems in low dimensional topology blew open. So uh, Fentuschel Stern in 85 and 90 and Fruta in 90 showed, well, first that this group is infinite. There's a Z, a Z subgroup coming from just the powers of the Poincaré homology sphere. That's an application of Donaldson's theorem pretty much. And then that there's a Z infinity subgroup in fact. Um, and I'll remark that the proof that there's a Z infinity subgroup there goes through there being a Z infinity subgroup of the subgroup generated by the Seifert fibered spaces. Okay, so the, that is to say closed oriented homology spheres admitting an S1 action with no fixed points of which the breeze point spheres are examples. Okay, so, um, and then subsequently, uh, Freshav in 2010 show that this group surjects on the Z. That means it has a Z summand. Uh, we recall from algebra class that's stronger than having a subgroup. These statements are in a reasonable order. And then sort of the big development that informs most of the work in the rest of this talk. In 2013, Chipri and Manalescu sh showed that there's no Y of order two in the homology cobordism group with Rachlin invariant one. Okay, and, and why was that important? Well, work of Gulusky Stern and Matamoto from the 70s showed previously that that statement was equivalent to the fact there existing non-triangulable topological manifolds in every dimension greater than or equal to five. Okay, uh, what do those words mean? A uh, triangulation is a homeomorphism to the geometric realization of a simplicial complex. Uh, every smooth manifold is triangulable by work of Cairns and Whitehead in the 30s and 30s and well, technically 40, um, which means that everything through up through dimension three is triangulable. In the late 80s, uh, Kassen showed that Friedman's E8 manifold in dimension four is not triangulable. Uh, topological manifolds in higher dimensions were open until this work of Triprion's. Okay, and, and a remark that in general, we don't know anything about the existence of torsion. We don't know whether there is any, that's still an open question. 
All right, um, and while I'm listing theorems along these lines with what group, what subgroups and summons and so on this group has, um, let's all mention that in 2018, uh, Dai, Stoff, Reagan, and Trump show that theta 3z has a z infinity sum end. And I'm going to talk a little bit about their proof in a minute in the context of talking about what I'm building up to. OK, so I, I said you can ask about this group all the questions you'd normally ask about this group. You can also remember that this is a group of three manifolds and ask questions about which classes in it are represented by what kinds of three manifolds. So here are some, some, here's some work along those lines. So maybe the earliest result, result that answers questions like this is that in 81, Livingston showed that every class is represented by an irreducible manifold. So everything is homology coordinate to something irreducible. And in 83, this was improved by Myers to everything is homology coordinate to something hyperbolic. That's nice. Hyperbolic manifolds are sort of generic in some important sense. And then you can also ask, well, is everything represented by a ciphered fiber space? And the answer to that question is no. And that was shown by Stoffrigan and Lin in about 2015 and also by Forshav in unpublished work. Um, and th this is using, uh, in the case of Stoffrigan and Lin work descended from Chip Young's work on the previous slide. And, an and in another direction, you can ask, well, is everything represented by surgery on a knot? Okay, so we recall that the licorice Wallace theorem says that everything is surgery on some link, so not a knot, possibly multiple components. And that not every three manifold is surgery on a single knot. The first examples were given by Ockley. So the next question after that as well is everything homology coordinate to a surgery on a knot. This was recently answer answered in the negative by Nozaki Sato and Tanaguchi using filtered instant on homology. Um, and, and maybe another nice recent result is uh, that every is every is everything represented by a Stein fillable manifold? Answer turns out to be yes, recent work of Merkeji. Okay. Um, but going back to this question for just a moment, once you know that not everything is homology coordinate to a ciphered fibered space, you can ask if the classes, gener classes represented by ciphered fibered spaces generate the group, uh, which is the same question as, is everything homology coordinate to a linear combination of ciphered fibered spaces with some orientations? So you can ask, is theta 3z the subgroup theta 3sf? And the theorem, main theorem of today is that the answer is no. And indeed, the classes that are plus one surgery on some connect sum of torus knots written down there. There's some pictures of torus knots for the uh, entertainment of the audience below. Where here, uh, n is going to be greater than or equal to three and odd, generate a z infinity subgroup in the quotient of the homology cobordism group by the group generated by the ciphered fibered spaces. OK, so this concludes part one of the talk. And now you've heard a theorem. Now let me tell you a little bit about where the theorem is coming from. OK, so I, I mentioned Chip Young's disproof of the triangulation conjecture earlier. So what tools does that use? That uses a pin two equivariant version of his invariant for three manifolds, cyber and floor homology. So um, what's the moral picture there look like? We're not going to say details, but in particular, if you've got an integer homology sphere, you associate to it some pin two spectrum constructed from solutions to the cyber Gwitten equations on the manifold. Um, and here, pin two is a subgroup of the unit quaternions that looks like two copies of the complex circle. Um, I've drawn them next to each other, but they're actually linked. They form a hop link that's just sort of impossible to draw in a way where people can understand the other notation on it. And uh, the, we've got a map between the two copies of the circle, j, such that um, j squared is minus one. So you can see that there. And ij is minus ji. Oops, there's not supposed to be a minus sign there. That's just a typo. My apologies. OK, um, and we see this as an order four subgroup then generated by j inside of it. OK, and today we're going to work in the setting actually of Ozhroth and Zabo's Hagard flare homology, which is, in, which is equivalent along some chain of equivalences due to many people to, in the version we're going to look at, S1 equivariant cyber and flare homology. Um, now, it's a, a general fact that if you take a space with a pin two action, and you form the Borel construction with respect to the S1 sitting inside of pin two that contains the identity. Um, in the space, it, it, once you've done that, the space you're looking at, the action of J, which was previously order four, presumably becomes order two. So I'm gonna be looking at um, Hager floor homology with an involution, which is the thing that corresponds to the action of J. Okay, so um, that was a bunch of hand-waving. Now maybe a few words about what a thing I'm actually looking at. 
So we're going to look at Haygard floor homology and in particular the involutive variant of Haygard floor homology. And there are many, many versions. I'm just going to introduce one here. So in the version we're going to consider, we'll restrict ourselves to integer homology spheres for the sake of things being simpler. So, Ojvath, so given a, let's say, an integer homology sphere, Ojvath and Zabo associate to it um, a chain complex CF minus of Y. So this is some free finitely generated graded F2 adjoined U chain complex. F2 is the field with two elements. U is some variable of degree minus two. So they constructed this in the early 2000s. It's had tons of applications. Um, algebraic features of this include the fact that if I take the homology and localize it U, so I let U have an inverse, then the homology is just F2 U U inverse. So um, this is after killing any U torsion. And uh, what does it mean that we're considering the involutive theory? It means we're considering this along with some uh, graded chain map iota y from the complex to itself, which squares to something chain homotopy equivalent to the identity. I'll say a word about its construction in a minute. And maybe uh, considering this chain map as well started with me and Chiprian in 2015, and then the technical properties were elaborated more substantially by Asini and Zemke the following year. Okay, and um, where is this coming from, the two-minute version? How do you get Haggard floor homology? Well, you take your three-manifold and you take a self-indexing Morse function on it, as drawn there. Um, and, and maybe in the version I want, you have one index zero critical point and one index three critical point. And then um, if I look at the pre-image of three halves, that's not a critical value, so I'm supposed to get a, a smooth sub-manifold, I get a surface. It's genus G, where G is the number of index one or equivalently index two critical points. Um, I then look at the ascending manifolds of my index one critical points that, and they intersect the surface in some collection of curves drawn in red there and called the alpha curves. So a bunch of simple closed curves that don't intersect each other, G of them. Similarly, I look at the descending manifolds of my index two critical points and they intersect the surface in some other collection of curves called the beta curves. And then I also keep track of where a flow line from the index three to index zero critical point pierces the surface and that's a base point for the three manifold. Okay, and how do I get the chain complex? The generators are tuples of intersection points between the curves and the differential count solutions to some partial differential equations in an auxiliary higher dimensional symplectic manifold. And I think that's all we'll say about that. Okay, and then where is this involution I mentioned then coming from? Well, say I have a Hagar diagram for my three manifold. Oh wait, I didn't say on the previous page, but all of this data I've described together is called a Hagar diagram for the three manifold, and it's enough to recover the three manifold. So if I start with a Hagar diagram and uh, the chain complex constructed from that Hagar diagram, um, I can take my Morse function and f and turn it upside down, which is to say replace it with three minus f, so it stays self-indexing. And that's the same thing as changing the orientation of the surface and switching which set of curves is which. That's all that does. And if you follow through the construction of the chain complex, it's immediately obvious that that induces a chain isomorphism between the complexes coming from those Hagar diagrams. And then if I have two Hagar diagrams from the same, for the same three manifold, I can always pick a path of moves between them, consisting of isotopies, handle sides of the curves, and stabilizations of the diagram. Um, that gets me from one to the other, and that induces, due to work of Oshwath and Zobo, a chain homotopy equivalence between the chain complexes. And the composition of those two maps is my map iota y. Okay, so you'll notice there was some vagueness with that path of Hagard moves business. Um, that's sort of not a property of the fact that I'm explaining this in hand wavy terms. That is a bit vague. And you need some naturality results for in Hagard floor homology to show that what you're going to get is an, in, is an invariant up to equivariant chain homotopy equivalence. And indeed, I won't say very much about it, but the sort of main idea between the proofs um, underlying this talk is getting a better model than just any path of Hagard knows for that last part. Okay, so that's where that's coming from. And before I move on, allow me to mention um, a technical property proved by uh, me and Chaprian and Ian, which is that this plays extremely nicely with connect sum. If I have a connect sum of two, three manifolds, well, this part is Ojvath and Zabo. So they showed that if you have a connect sum, you just take a tensor product. And then we showed that also you just take a tensor product of the involutions, which is the nicest thing you could possibly hope for. Okay. Okay, so now we've got this data. We've got chain complex and we've got chain map. 
there are several appropriate notions of equivalence of this data. Um, notion zero, which is a suspicious thing to call a notion. Um, I mentioned that the most natural notion of equivalence maybe is equivariant chain homotopy equivalence. So that's, you know, I have chain homotopy, chain homotopy equivalences between the two complex. Maybe those maps are chain homotopy inverses of each other and they commute up to homotopy equivalence with the involutions. And if you are in this nice situation, then it's sometimes we package this data as the homology of the mapping cone of the map one plus iota y. Um, so this means I have two copies of the same complex here and I use a variable q to distinguish them. And this comes out as a module over F2 adjoin u comma q, degree q is minus one and then, I, and then q squared is zero. Um, this is the uh, homology of BZ4 and F2 coefficients. So we see that this is sort of a Z4, sorry, this has the algebraic structure of a Z4 equivariant theory, as you might expect if you believe that thing about the order four subgroup in pin two. Um, why is this? So um, this is sort of the thing that you'd expect from just homeomorphism or picking different Hagar diagrams for your three manifold. Um, why is it not what I want today? Because it's not an invariant of homology cobordism. You know, homology cobordism between two integer homology spheres need not induce an equivariant chain homotopy equivalence between these pairs of data. Um, that's no good for my purpose. So what are we going to do instead? We're going to need to weaken this relationship. Uh, Okay, uh, so with that in mind, well, first we'll um, sort of make more formal this business with having a chain complex and a map. We'll say that algebraically an iota complex is anything fulfilling the requirement, the requirements on the previous slide, which is to say free finitely generated F2 adjoin U complex with, um, if I localize it, the homology at U, I just get F2 U U inverse and a grading preserving map iota such that, and here I've written the fact that it's a chain map and that it squared is chain homotopy equivalent to the identity in a slightly unusual way for the reasons that will become clear momentarily, but that's all that's been written there. Here H is a map that raises grading by one in the usual fashion. So I'm just saying there is a map H such that. Okay, and two iota complexes are locally equivalent if there are maps in both directions between them that induce isomorphisms on the localized homology and that again commute up to some chain homotopy equivalence with the involutions on either side. Okay, so this is a, a weaker notion of, equiv of equivalence between iota complexes. And why is it a, a, nice, a, a nice notion to think about? Well, it turns out that homology cobordisms induce local equivalences between the, the iota complexes associated to the manifolds. And furthermore, uh, the notion, because of what we said about connected sum and tensor product playing nicely with each other, this gives a homomorphism from theta three Z, which we recall is a complicated group full of topological things to the group of iota complexes up to local equivalence with the group operation given by the tensor product operation, which in principle, we know everything about. It's just, you know, define, it's just chain complexes. It's defined using some algebra. Um, and, and that's encouraging. Um, however, it's not as great as we might hope. The reason being, it turns out this group written I tilde is still fairly complicated. It's for example, got two torsion. Um, and, we th and it turns out, well, it's a little bit difficult to understand, but that's okay. Somebody else had a great idea. So it turns out that if you weaken this relationship even more to something called almost local equivalence, things get much simpler. So here the word almost means modulo u throughout. So this is all sort of the same definitions, except instead of having a chain map such that del iota plus iota del is actually zero, I just want it to be something that's in the image of the variable u. And similarly throughout for all the other relations. Oh, oops, I didn't put the iota bars on that. All right, there we go. So notice that that doesn't actually have to be a chain map anymore, but it turns out that if you weaken this such that everything's in the image of you, this idea is due to Diham, Stoffrig, and Entrung, you get a further map from the homology cobordism group to, now we're mapping to the group of almost iota complexes up to almost local equivalence. The group operation is still the tensor product operation. And that group, it turns out, is a lot more straightforward. It's totally ordered and everything in it can be represented by some standard chain complex up to almost local equivalence. Okay, so this is a great idea they had. Um, 
And indeed, it's the idea behind their theorem that I mentioned earlier that theta 3z has a z infinity sub end, which I promised I'd tell you a little bit about subsequently. But the thing that I want to focus on right now is that they were also able to compute the image of the subgroup generated by the ciphered fibered spaces inside of this group. And in particular, um, using previous computations of Dai Manolescu, Dai, and Dai and Stoffregen, they were able to show that there are some things that are definitely outside of it. Okay, and indeed, um, so I've written an example of a complex there, which is approximately functioning as a pretty picture, but the point is that for n greater than or equal to two, you can give some chain complex Cn, which is not in the image of theta three SF in the, up to almost local in the group of almost iota complexes. And indeed, uh, using pretty much their techniques ported straight over, you can show that neither is any um, of those things with uh, any, uh, uh, any sum of those things of the, and their duals. Okay, so now the name of the game is, all right, realize those complexes or realize, you know, infinitely many of them, don't have to actually get all of them, as the almost local, as the uh, almost aorta complex is associated to some three manifolds. And then those three manifolds can, are outside of the group generated by the ciphered fibered spaces, or rather their homology cohortes of class is R. Okay, and of course, I'm going to tell you that that's what we did. So uh, here's the slide somehow that has all the work. All right, so um, the theorem is that there's a formula for computing the involutive floor homology of surgeries um, from invariants associated to the knot. Um, you, um, okay, um, and this is sort of in parallel to Ojwath and Zabo give a formula for computing the Hagar floor homology, uh, the Hagar floor homology of three manifolds, which are surgeries from Hagar floor invariants associated to the knot. This is an elaboration of that. Um, okay, and, and you might say, does this make things any better? How computable are the involutive invariants associated to knots? Well, the answer is, yeah. but however, they're, they're easy to compute for torus knots. Um, that's due to me and Chikrian. And there's a nice formula for computing them for connected sums. That's due to Ian. Okay, so um, which means that the theorem here is that the almost local equivalence class of those three manifolds I mentioned earlier, plus one surgeries on T23 connect sum uh, minus two copies of T2n, 2n plus one, connect sum a copy of T2n, 4n plus one. So um, the almost local equivalence class of that is, it's actually Cn minus one from the previous page. Um, for n greater than or equal to three is some odd number, which you'll, you'll notice there are infinitely many of those. And that gives the main theorem that there's a Z infinity subgroup that sits inside of theta three Z quotiented by theta three SF. All right, okay, and that finishes that up. All right, so, um, and I think at this juncture, I'll thank you for your time. Thanks, Kristen.